I am. My name's Courtney Rowe. I'm out of the Austin area and I am the events chair for this year. So we are so glad to have you all. Please remember to fill out your name in the participants pane with your first and last name so that you can receive your uh, professional development hour certificate. And I'm going to drop this link one more time in the chat. Please fill out our amazing dashboard for Survey123 so that we can see everybody who's uh, here today. Uh, we usually used to put it only in the chat, but now we have an amazing dashboard that we can go back and look at. So please uh, don't forget to do that. Wow, Eurissa, Texas has been doing an amazing job. We are uh, once again, the chapter of the year. So I want uh, everybody to recognize that we have been doing such great work as Eurissa, Texas. Thank you all for joining us at Speaker Series as one of our um, staple events. So we're really glad to have y'all. Next month, we're doing our Speaker Series on Charm and GIS. So really excited about that. That's going to be on November 29th with uh, Stephen from Texas A&M. Be on the lookout for lots of great events coming up. And we have our Mappy Hour in Austin after the Texas GIO meeting on October 26th at Meanwhile Brewing. Uh, Texas GIS Day is a Texas-wide initiative for all of the GIS days that happen in person to be able to post their events or offer them hybrid. And you can join us from anywhere in the world on Texas GIS Day to see our great events and catch Eurissa, Texas there Tuesday night, November 15th for our organization Mappy Hour at 5 p.m. Then after the ATX GIS Day, we're gonna have a Mappy Hour in Austin on November 14th and be on the lookout for one in Houston on November 16th. So we can't wait to have you all involved in GIS Day and involved with Eurissa, Texas. I'll drop a volunteer link for you in the chat. And once again, welcome to our speaker series for today. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, well, once again, welcome to the October 2022 uh, speaker series. Today, we're joined by Sarah Taylor, GISP, who is the manager, uh, the GIS manager at Texas 811 based out of Richardson, Texas. Sarah's here to talk to us today about uh, a recently unveiled implementation of the service area editor, uh, an open source application uh, designed to manage the service areas of member utilities. Uh, with that, Sarah, I will hand the floor to you. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Courtney, for sharing all of the events. Um, it's great to see all of our attendees here today. Um, I will turn on my camera momentarily just to say hi to everybody. I will not keep it on during the presentation just for um, internet <laughs> capabilities, but um, thank you everybody for attending. Again, um, as Matt said, I am Sarah Taylor. I'm the GIS manager with Texas 811, um, and I'm here to show you our service area editor. So thank you all for coming. So a uh, little bit about me. Um, I know Matt did a quick introduction. Um, I am also the treasurer for ERISA Texas and the past president for the Mid-Atlantic chapter of ERISA, serving as kind of a dual role there. Um, I've served as the 2020 to 2022 ERISA GIS Pro Conference Committee member, and I'm the current chair of the ERISA Chapter Development and Relationships Council. Um, I received my GISP in 2010. And I hold a Bachelor of Science from Rutgers University in New Jersey and an additional post back in GIS uh, from Penn State. So a little bit about Texas 811. Our mission is to facilitate damage prevention, promote public safety, and protect the environment through stakeholder education and communication. So what does that actually mean? Texas 811 serves as the notification center for the call before you dig system um, out of the state of Texas. So the 811 system is a national mandate that is implemented state by state, um, kind of similar to how the 911 system works, uh, but we're focused on uh, safety in digging and utilities. 
So we serve as the notification center for that. We don't do any of the locating. Um, we're not actually in the field. We just basically receive the data, process it, and send out notifications. Uh, we were founded in 1984, and we are a nonprofit and the largest one call notification center in the country, mostly because we're in a, you know, one of the largest states, and we have more than 2,000 members. So we're also part of a existing partnership. So we are one of 11 states that are part of the Progressive Partnering Network. Um, here in Texas, we also serve as the vendor for South Dakota and West Virginia, as well as all the states that are shown here on the map um, are partners with us. So what is a ticket in terms of the 811 system? Basically, a ticket is generated anytime someone wants to go out and put a hole in the ground, whether that is to put a planter or a tree in your front yard or something larger like um, excavating for a new utility or putting in a new road. Basically, anytime you're breaking ground, you should have a ticket in with 811. How our life cycle works is the utilities are, are mapped by the utility members. They're sent to us where they're generated into a service area. A ticket is created when either an excavator or a homeowner calls in to report that they're going to dig. We produce a member notification from that. Um, within that system, members have the option to bring that into an existing work order management system that, may, that they may have in-house. And that generates a locate either to an internal locator or to um, an outside locator, typically USIC. And then what we'd like to close the gap on is that information going from when the data is located to actually updating the utilities associated with it. So that's kind of this closed loop that we're showing here. So what is a service area? So for us, what a utility service area represents is the actual line or point in the ground uh, of the underground asset, and then an area of protection around it. So for our system, the minimum that we require is a 10 foot buffer. And you can have a buffer as large as you need. So for some of the Railroad Commission recommendations, it may go as high as um, 660 feet or 1,000 feet, um, but our service area minimum is a 10-foot buffer, which represents a 20-foot width. We require all of our service areas to be recorded as polygon data. That's just the nature of how the system was developed, um, but our member utilities can submit their information to us as points, lines, polygons, and we'll generate a service area from that if they do not have one already in-house. So what's our current process for receiving utility information? We've just updated all of our processes inside of Texas 811 for our service area editor application. So our current process is to have members submit their updates directly through the online application. So directly through service area editor. They'll complete an associated form just to let us know what their intention is with the data, who to send their confirmation files to, all of the you know, necessary extra information about the utility. We'll review that in-house. One of our five technicians will review every ticket that comes in and we'll send a confirmation email to the member letting them know when their data will be live. Members can go directly back into that mapping system and confirm their live data. Um, one of the things that Service Area Editor allows us to do is keep all of the data within one system. So anytime we're confirming what a member's done or a member's confirming their own data, it's all within the Texas 811 system. So this isn't an outside application. So that data becomes live for ticketing and notification purposes on the next available live date, which is a Tuesday or a Friday following um, the receipt of the confirmation. And then if you need any assistance with the application or with GIS at 811 in general, you can reach out to us at gismail at texas811.org. We accept three main mapping submissions formats through this new system. So we're looking at a GeoJSON, which is an open source GIS format, a zipped Esri shapefile, which is a very common Esri base, and a Google KML. We also accept additional formats. If you don't have GIS capabilities, we can assist you in converting files but the online system itself is only able to accept these formats. 
GeoJSON may not be familiar to everyone. It's not an ESRI-based format. It's an open source format. If you look at a GeoJSON file in the text editor, you can see it includes the coordinates of every vertice. It tells you what type of features are included, and it's typically in a WGS84 projection. For our requirements, the geometry of any data submitted must be open source uh, valid, not just ESRI valid. So if you're using any tools to uh, check or repair the geometry on any of your data sets, the one we recommend is in ArcGIS Pro using the OGC validation. The, again, um, the only formats we accept are polygon or multi-polygon for this system. So what types of submissions can you provide to us? When we receive data from our members, we can do additions to their database, we can do deletions from their database, we can fully replace an entire subset of data at any given time, and we can transfer assets between different organizations. So when you're submitting an addition, you would only supply us the mapping for that addition and no additional data. I know that sounds a bit confusing. Um, when you're doing a deletion, you would supply us just the areas that you want to delete. Typically what will happen there is if you've submitted a deletion to us and it appears that there may be a secondary line or secondary coverage conflicting with that, we'll ask you to submit a full replacement just to make sure that all of the data is consistent. On asset transfers, we recommend that any utility member reach out to our member services team just to make sure that everyone on both sides of the transfer understand the process and are able to appropriately complete the forms to make a seamless asset transfer. Typically, these occur when one utility buys the assets of another utility. Um, occasionally, it will be um, utilities that are abandoned and were never picked up by another member. So how do you sign up for the new application? So Texas 811 has another application known as the portal. The portal is used for viewing tickets and managing tickets, and that is the interface that allows us to sign up for the service area editor. So if you're reaching out to Texas 811 to sign up for the service area editor, you'll need a portal account to start. We'll need the email address of that portal account. We will never ask for your password. Um, and you'd need to let us know what codes you need access to view. A code is the notification format. So if you're receiving a ticket from Texas 811, it will list the code for your utility. A utility may have one or more codes at any given time, which is why we ask for specifically which codes you need access to. So let's talk a little bit more about the technical information about Service Area Editor. So it's run on an Azure Postgres database. Data is checked out of one schema and into another. One is the current and one is the working. And that is how we manage the versioning of the data. Data can be submitted as additions, deletions, or a full replacement, which we've talked about a little bit earlier. The system itself checks the submitted data for geometry errors and extra information such as excuse me, such as Z or M values. So we do not store measured values or elevation values in this particular system. The system subdivides the data to break up larger features into polygons that are less than 256 vertices. The reason we do that is for a display and data pull uh, ease of use. So you could have a member service area where they have lines running throughout their entire city, that may all interconnect and become one large polygon, we'll divide that up into much smaller pieces to allow it to come through. There are currently just over 2 million records in our system for the state of Texas. So what does a service area editor look like? Um, you'll come into the application via a UI link that gets sent specifically to you. Um, You'll click on service area editor here on the left. It will immediately display the map, um, in this case for Texas, and um, allow you to come through the system. This piece here where it says select a code is where your drop down menu will be to decide which code you want to choose. 
The important thing here is that each code is tied to a specific user. So what that means is I may have seven codes that I can access and my team member may have 15 codes that are accessible to them. There may be crossover between the codes that each of us has, but it's tied to a specific person so that we can track X, excuse me, so that we can track access to each code as well as edits that are made to a specific person. So the system is very user specific. So once you choose a code, the system will start loading the data. It displays this little um, wheel to tell you that it's loading through the system. Most codes display in uh, less than, I think, 15 seconds. Some larger codes will take a little bit more time depending on how complicated the geometry is. Um, so we do have a loading interface for you. This is just an example of a very simplistic code for testing purposes. We're actually prohibited from sharing any direct member information outside of Texas 811. So I apologize, I can't show you any real live data today. Um, but this is our test code, which is just a blanket polygon on top of our Texas 811 building. Um, so the blue represents your current mapping or your unpublished data. This is where you will see any edits that you've generated or that anyone else has generated and represents what will go live on the next available live date. If you click on the show published button, it will turn on the published service areas, which are the data that is current for ticketing purposes. So in this case, they're exactly the same. So you can see it turned kind of a gold color. Um, but in some cases, you'll see uh, differences between what's current and what's published, meaning that you've had some edits. Um, if you have edits that are unpublished, they will still show up in blue. If you have deletions in your data, they will show up as a transparent yellow and you won't see the blue underneath. So what are all of our map navigation tools that we have available within the system? Um, along the toolbar in the top right hand of the screen, you can zoom in or zoom out by scrolling up or down on your mouse, or you can go left or right on this uh, blue dot in our zoom window. The zoom controls are um, open source, excuse me, open layers defined zooms. So you'll notice on the map that we don't have a north arrow or a scale bar. It's not intended for that purpose. To pan the map, you can select the hand tool and click and drag anywhere in the map. To zoom to extents, you can click the, uh, the arrows tool, and that will zoom to the extent of any data that's live in the map. So the example I'll give is if you're just showing your current data, it will zoom to the extent of your current data. If you're showing the current and the published, it will zoom to the extent of both. You can also view alternate base map layers by selecting the map layers tool. Our primary base maps inside this application are Bing. So we have the Bing roads, Bing labeled aerials, and Bing aerials with no labels at all. We also have the Texas 811 parcel base and the Tenris WMS parcel base. The reason that we have both sets of parcels data is we may have updates to the parcels that are not yet available on Tenris or vice versa, depending on where they occur in the state. Texas 811 um, does maintain parcel data in our primary areas. So in um, your heavy metropolitan areas, we update our parcels on an annual basis. In rural areas, we may not update them quite as often. So we do give you the option to see both. Um, and then we have the county boundaries. The circle at the end of the toolbar, toolbar, excuse me, will refresh the map at any point. Um, and it's not really uh, a necessary tool, but it's something that is included in nearly every WebGIS application. We also give you the option to measure on the map. And the caveat I always give to measuring on the map is this is a web-based GIS application. So be very cautious of the measurements that you're getting. These are not ground truth measurements or anything like that. They are estimates. Uh, but you can select the triangle on the map to measure, and then you can choose a measurement format of line, point, or polygon. In the line example here, you can see the uh, 
black hash line at the top of the polygon showing the measurement in miles, feet, and yards. In the polygon example, it goes all the way around the, the area that we've chosen and shows the area additionally in acres and miles squared. And then the circle example shows the same coordinates just um, on, a, on a circle or a radius. So what can you do to get a copy of your data while you're in Service Area Editor? So to get a copy of the currently submitted edits, you'll select um, the little cloud arrow button to download a copy of either your current service area or your published service area. Both of these will download as a GeoJSON format currently. We are in the process of unveiling the option to be able to download as a shapefile as well. Um, but again, the current is what represents your edited data and the published represents your data that is live for ticketing. Each data that downloads has a specific file format name so that you can tell which of these you've actually downloaded. So how do we edit in this system? In order to have editing capabilities, you'll need to reach out to the Texas 811 GIS team to schedule an actual editor training. The reason we do that is we wanna validate who has access to the system for editing purposes, make sure that they have some level of GIS understanding, um, let them know how the system works, uh, make sure they're aware of all of our internal procedures just so that there isn't anyone going in and editing things that are not possible. So if you click edit, that will start your edit session. You can click to show the published if you prefer, but you don't necessarily have to for editing purposes. So in this example, we started an edit session. You can see that it's recorded on the left here, um, the name of the code that we're editing. Um, it's assigned a GUID ID number to the editing session. All of those are unique so that we can track all of the edit session activity and it's transitioned to an editing state, what timestamp that occurred, and then who did that. In this example, it's just a test user, but this would have your login information recorded. So what are your editing tools that are available to you? You can make an addition by selecting the draw addition tool. You can make a deletion by selecting the draw deletion tool. Both of those tools have the ability to add or delete in a point line or polygon format. So I know I talked a little bit about earlier how we only select, excuse me, we only accept data in polygon format. The system allows you to draw in point and line format and it will generate an automated buffer. So it will automatically uh, convert that to a polygon format. So we'll show you what that looks like. To save any geometry that you've then drawn in, you can choose the little save icon. And if you want to clear any geometry that you have not um, previously saved, you can clear unsaved geometry. At any point during your session, if you've made unintentional edits and saved them, you can cancel your session, which will abandon your edits and start over. So save does not necessarily commit the data to the database, it commits it to your session. To upload a full replacement of your data, you can click the upload full replacement tool. This tool will only be available once you're in an edit session. And the requirements for a full replacement are that it must be submitted as a polygon format in either a Google KML with no Z or M values, a zip shape file, or a GeoJSON format, and it must be projected to WGS84. The system is not currently designed to either check or validate the projection that you're using. Typically what we've seen as an error is someone will attempt to upload data that's in um, NAD 27. And once it loads into the system, it has a, um, a marked shift in the data. And that's how we identify that possibly there's a projection issue, but the system doesn't report that in any way. So just be very careful if you're using this option to make sure that you're using the correct projection of your data. You can also upload a series of adds or deletes as a file and not just do a full replacement. Um, the same information applies. Your file loads must be submitted as a Google KML, zip shapefile, or GeoJSON. 
We're very specific in the Google Pay ML format because the, the nature of the open layer system that we're using, it does not have the ability at this point to unzip a Google KMZ. So in Google Earth terms, a KMZ is just a zipped version of KML, and at this point, it can only read the KML file type. So this is just walking through what drawing in an addition looks like. Um, so it looks very similar to the tool you saw with the measurements earlier. It's just it's not a hatched line. Um, you can draw very specifically to the edge of the service area that you're intending to add to, but it's not necessary. Our recommendation is that when you're making an addition that you actually overlap the existing service area, which is a little bit counterintuitive um, for GIS folks. But what that allows the system to do is merge that data together to make sure we don't have any individual slivers between an area and an addition and the existing service area. So you can see as you're drawing through um, your clicking points, only where you want vertices to occur. So in the same way that you draw in pretty much any other GIS system, you're having a starting coordinate, and a finishing coordinate, and you do not have to draw back to the starting coordinate. Once you draw that, let's say, third coordinate in a polygon, it will, um, once you double click, it will finish and complete that polygon back to the original point. So when the polygon is complete, the area will display in transparent green on the map. So you can see that here. Um, this essentially means that your edits have not been committed to your session. When you're adding lines, you can add a line. Um, in the example here, we've done it along a right of way. The nature of the system has a default buffer of 300 feet. So what you can see the system has done here is I've drawn a line along this right of way and it's immediately buffered it out to 300 feet with rounded edges and created an associated surface area for that uh, line. So the system default is 300 feet. We do have the ability to change the system default on a per code basis. The caveat to that is once we do make that change, it's for every user on that code moving forward. So we recommend that if you're going to use that as an option that you define what your custom buffer will be and that you let everyone on your team know that that's what it is moving forward. Same thing with adding a point. When you add a point, it will add the default buffer or the custom buffer if you have one set for your code to create a polygon from what you've just drawn. Deleting polygons is a little bit different um, where when you're deleting something, we do ask that you go in a little bit of an overlap just to make sure that you're catching all of the individual vertices or um, radii that are on any particular feature. So in the example here, I'm trying to trim off this buffer along Broadmoor Drive uh, just to clean up the edging on this service area. So I've drawn along the right of way where I want the cut to actually occur and included slightly outside the service area itself where I want the deletion to occur. When the polygon is complete for a deletion, it will change to a transparent red on the map. And that is so you can track as you're going through your session where you have green additions or red deletions. Same thing applies when you're deleting a line. Any line that you draw will be immediately buffered out. One of the things that you can see on this map here is that I've tried to delete the exact same line that I drew before in terms of the right of way, where there are tiny blue slivers on the bottom along Stoneboro Lane which is why we don't recommend doing deletions in this format unless it is entirely disconnected from the rest of your service area. Um, once you save this and it actually pushes the deletion through, it will no longer show that area in blue and you can identify any slivers that are left behind. Same thing here with the point buffer. I've tried to select the exact same point that I selected on my addition. Um, Based on this view, you can't really tell if I have or haven't, um, but once I save these edits, we would be able to see if there were any slivers left behind, and then we could continue editing after we've saved as necessary. 
So once you're ready to save the edits that you've done in your session, you can click on the save icon to save your drawn geometries. You can click on clear on save geometry if you don't want to commit those to your session. You can use the note tool on the left hand panel to include any pertinent information. Your notes are tied to your session and users can only view their individual session information from a viewing perspective. Um, if you want to have someone else in your company have access to um, the notes and or session history from other users, that's something you should reach out to the Texas 811 GIS team to configure. That's not available by default. Um, once you click submit, you've submitted your edits to the GIS department for review and closed your session. Once you hit submit, you will not be able to go back to an editing state without reaching out to the Texas 811 GIS team. Um, the other important thing here that I uh, failed to mention earlier is that once a code has started an edit session, it is locked. So no one else either at that company and no one else in Texas 811 can then edit that code because it's in a locked state. It's been essentially checked out as a version once the submission occurs and the approval occurs, it gets checked back in as a completed updated version. Um, so if for some reason you were to submit your data, realize you made a mistake, you can reach out to the Texas 811 team to either override that or reject the session. The note here is to just uh, please remember to complete your member mapping submission form once you submit your data. You will receive an email to your portal email address that lets you know that your session has been um, submitted and to provide a link to that form as well. So if you're doing a full replacement, you would again start an editing session in the same way that you would in any other um, scenario, but you would select the upload a full replacement tool. A full replacement replaces the entire data set for that code. So if you've got, um, in this example, I've got two features in this code, I would re be replacing both of those features with whatever data I upload. Um, so in some cases, you may have a code that is 5,000 or 10,000 features. Full replacement is meant to update your entire code where you may have um, a series of adds and deletes kind of all over your service area because you have refined your mapping or, or cleaned up your buffers or maybe changed your buffer value across the board. When you submit a full, or excuse me, when you start a full replacement, it will confirm that you understand what it's doing and that you know you're doing a full replacement. Um, and these processes may take a little bit more time depending on the volume of your code. So talking a little bit more uh, about file requirements, um, once you review your changes, you can actually see your changes occurring in the activity tracking of the session. So you can see here, it's tracking that I've changed it to an editing state, that I've updated the working copy with one submission. In this case, I'll go back a slide really fast. Um, I've done a full replacement of a existing code with two features and then come back and replaced it with one. So it's updated the working copy with my one submission and it's effectively deleting anything else that was in that code. The same way in any session, once you're complete and you've reviewed it, you can select submit to close your session. So that's the gist of service area editor. We at Texas 811 do have an in-house GIS staff, but we don't have um, enough staff with enough capabilities to say that a member utility could reach out to us with a PDF map of their water lines and we would be able to help them generate GIS data from that. So what we've done over the course of a few years is partnered with a few different geospatial organizations to say, we're going to recommend you as a contractor. We've reached out to you. We validated that you have either a GIS group or a GIS division in some cases, and that you are a consultant base that can support member utilities generating their own GIS data. Uh, so the three companies that we currently recommend are Axon Geospatial, Langen, and Magnolia River. Um, I think Chris Aiken is here on the call today from Langen. I don't think I have anybody from 
Axum Geospatial or Magnolia River here today. Uh, but I will have the links to all of these different organizations, as well as any links that have been included in the presentation in the YouTube recording once that is available. Oh, it looks like I do have somebody from Magnolia River. Thank you. I can't see your name in the chat, but I appreciate you all joining. Um, so I think I've left a sufficient amount of time for questions. I know I tend to fly through presentations, so I apologize if I've talked too fast. Uh, but I'm happy to go back to any of the slides. Um, Matt or Brian, do you have a place for me to start for questions? Yeah, yeah, uh, Sarah. Uh, so we can back up here a little bit. Uh, Tom Consul asked a number of questions in here. So I will uh, back up to his first question and go from there. Um, okay. So t Tom's first question is, uh, is the submission process and mapping application fully secured? Fully secure in what in what term? It's it's you can't log into the application and you can't see anything without a linked portal account with a username and password. Um, it's not an encrypted application. If that's what you're asking, I'm not really sure. Tom, if you want to unmute and expand upon that, feel free to. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. go ahead. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I was just uh, making sure that it was fully secure from you know other organizations and uh, from anyone else seeing the data. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, our data is secure. That's all. Yeah. So because of the nature of how Texas Eight One One is set up under the state law, we're not permitted to share your mapping with any other organization. So that's why everything is tied to a specific user. We validate um, that the user has a valid email address within that company's domain. And then if you are using a consultant to manage your GIS data, you actually have to submit a letter to us, letting us know that you're authorizing that consultant to have access to your data. All right, thank you. All right, um, so we'll go ahead and move on to Tom's next question here, which is, um, a great one. Can you link to our online map service having our up-to-date parcel layer? Not at this time. That is a, a future state of data management that we're hoping to get to. Um, but currently we are, you know, we're one of 11 partner states all using the same software. Um, so as those states get that similar request from their members, um, at some future state, we should be able to use some kind of API scenario, but not currently. All right. Uh, so one more here from Tom. Uh, does the buffer symbolize the area in which the work requests and or locates will be performed? That is a great question, Tom. And I actually deleted some slides about that, so I wish I hadn't. But um, the buffer in this system refers to the buffer around the utility. So there is a buffer on the other side of the system when you talk about the work area or the area where excavation is occurring. There is a blanket 150 foot buffer on that at all times. So where that 150 foot buffer intersects your service area buffer is actually where a notification or a ticket will occur. But that's a great question. Okay. Um, so D White asks, why is your default 300 foot on the buffer when the standard for submission is 10 to 20 foot? That's another great question. So our default is 300 feet because it is based on um, the understanding that not everyone's GIS data is accurate. We only recommend that you go down to the minimum of a 10 foot buffer if you have survey grade accuracy on your GIS data. Effectively, what happens as you reduce the buffer is you receive less and less notifications. So if you're not entirely confident in the location of your utilities themselves, you may not receive a notification where you would have wanted one, if that makes sense. So we're dealing with some utilities who um, have you know, aging systems, 50 year old water lines that they don't necessarily know where they are. So they may have a blanket coverage of 300 feet on every right of way in their city, or they may just cover their entire city so that they always receive a notification. And then we have utilities that have been accurately and adequately mapped to survey grade GPS accuracy, and then they're comfortable using a 10-foot buffer. 
All right, makes sense. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, moving on here, we have a question. A question from Chris Aiken, and he asks: Is joining eight one one required by all municipal utility and cam campus entities? So there is a yes and a no to that question. It is heavily dependent on what type of utility, excuse me, utility you operate. So we have class A facilities that are always required. And then we have class B facilities that are only required if they operate under certain conditions. So I apologize, I'm not up to date on exactly where that line falls. Um, but generally speaking, if you operate electric, gas, uh, water or sewer, I believe you should be required. If you operate um, fiber or private utilities, you may not be, but I, I don't know if I'm saying that accurately. Okay. Um, all right. Addie asks, uh, do you have elevations for the utilities, valves, manholes? We do not. So we do not store any attribute level information about any of your utility data. And we do that from a security perspective. If in any case, anyone were in some scenario able to hack into our system, they wouldn't know anything about where your actual lines are beyond a service area. They also wouldn't know anything about your individual utility. Um, all of the codes are defined in such a way that you don't know what the utility type is. Um, so we don't store any level of, uh, ev excuse me, elevation data. And yes, call before you dig. Yeah. That is, that is our kind of our, our call sign is just to make sure that anytime you're digging for any reason, even if it's your, in your own front yard, make sure that you're calling. Um, there's a great case that I'll mention since we've got a few minutes um, to say that there was a, a, a guy who was doing some digging in his front yard on Super Bowl Sunday and knocked out his internet for his entire community. Um, that is, you know, not a worst case scenario because nobody died. Um, there wasn't any, you know, major implications from it, but he had some pretty pissed off neighbors. <laughs> so um, just make sure that you're aware that your, uh, your lines for fiber and internet can be very shallow. Um, if you call before you dig, we'll at least get somebody out there to mark those out. Um, and no, Tim, you cannot call while you dig. The requirement is to call two working days before excavation will occur. So you do need to plan out the work that you're doing um, just to give us time to have locators get on to that area. All right. Uh, so so uh, Tom asked another question here and uh, great one. Can I get clarification on whether or not we need to upload our infrastructure data or just the buffer of it? Uploading a buffer only feature class would ease our security concerns. And absolutely, and that is entirely up to the member utility. You have the option to um, decide to upload just the buffer and not ever provide us with your utility lines, or you have the option to provide us with the lines and allow our system to buffer for you. Um, the one caveat I will say to that is we did have a utility recently who let us know that it was taking them hours and hours to process their buffer on their system. Because this system is built on an Azure Postgres, it only took it a few minutes to buffer it out entirely. So in some cases, it's more efficient to do it this way. Um, when you submit data through this system as a line file, it doesn't get saved in that way. So you still wouldn't have any security concerns uploading your line files to SAE because it immediately converts it to a polygon and wipes out all of that submission information. Okay, uh, before we move on to the next question, let's clarify that Tom is with a group of people. So thank you to Tom's group for the great questions. <laughs> um, so Rafael Hernandez asks, is this service free? So the service area editor itself is a free application. There are no additional fees tied to that. The services of Texas 811 are tied to a notification fee, um, which is part of our membership. So there is a membership fee uh, with the state of Texas, and then there is a per ticket notification fee, which I, I don't wanna say this incorrectly, but I wanna say it's 95 cents currently. Okay. Um, so any 
other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box there. Um, we have enough time if you want to unmute and ask a question yourself. Um, okay, so we just got one here from uh, T7 Quickie. Uh, can we find out if a call was made on a ROW adjacent to our property line? Can we use that record to litigate for erosion? I believe if you wanted to do that, and I that is not my side of the house, um, you would reach out to our member services team and you would ask if they would be able to provide you a copy of a ticket. If you know the ticket number, our portal is open and you can um, log into the Texas 811 portal and actually do a, a ticket search on any ticket number that will show you that a ticket was called in, um, who called it in and when, and where the work was occurring. But you would have to know the ticket number to do that level of search. Um, if you're just looking to find out if a ticket was called out in your area, you would probably want to reach out to, to our team to have them help you with that information. Um, I can't say if it can be used for litigation purposes or not uh, definitively. I know that we have received subpoenas in the past and, and worked on issues like that. All right, once again, call for questions, uh, chat box, unmute yourself is fine. And if you have any questions that you think of um, after the fact, uh, you can reach out to my team at gismail at texas811.org. Um, you can reach out via our website to get a link to the application, information on how to sign up. Uh, the portal sign up is all on our website and some general information about our GIS team and the work that we do. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate everybody taking their lunch hour to sit with us today. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, I guess if there's no further questions, we can go ahead and conclude uh, this, this episode of the speaker series. Um, and we thank you all for attending.